Climbing to the top of the MMA mountain in your respective weight class is no easy feat, and sometimes your performance alone is not enough. The more attention you can draw to your next contest, the better, be that through trash talk on the mic or even calling out your next opponent. While this is by no means a requirement, there are many fighters who have subscribed to this school of thought and at the same time unfortunately underestimated the sleeping bear they were so casually booping on the nose with each exclamation of their own dominance or self-assuredness. Banging the drum for your own career trajectory is certainly understandable, but some fighters are also guilty of looking past their opponent, dismissing their skills entirely or exclaiming their delight at what will be a short night in the office. Hello, I'm Balian from MMA On Point and here are 10 fighters who bit off more than they could chew. Number 10. Phil Davis vs. Anthony Johnson Prior to his exit from UFC competition, Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis was at one point a promising contender in the UFC's light heavyweight division, boasting a 9-1 record in his first three years in the promotion. A potential matchup with then-champion John Jones was on the horizon, and for once it seemed we would see a contender with not only a similar size and build to the dominant champion, but also an even better wrestling pedigree. However, John was set to defend his title at UFC 172 against Glover Teixeira, and Phil Davis was inserted as the co-main event on that very same card. His opponent, a returning Anthony Rumble Johnson, making his first appearance in the UFC in two years. Davis, however, seemed far more concerned with the champion sat across from him during media week. Ariel Hawani even opened his interview noting, A lot of people at this point probably think you're fighting John Jones. You do know you're fighting Rumble, right? I've been told. It was clear Davis was looking past Rumble, replying to Ariel's further questions with, Do you want me to label someone UFC worthy outside the UFC? I just don't feel like that would be reasonable. Right. The matchup itself couldn't have been more one-sided, with Davis only landing 16% of his strikes and failing on all eight takedowns during the three-round bout. Rumble cemented himself as a fresh contender in the division, and Davis had to move to the back of the pack, and he never did get that fight with JBJ either. Number 9. Yair Rodriguez vs Frankie Edgar Whenever a new, young contender bursts onto the MMA scene, us fans get all riled up and excited, speculating on how far their unbridled talent and ability can carry them. And when it came to Yair Rodriguez, things were no different. After starching Andre Feely and BJ Penn with spectacular kicks and battling out wins over veterans Dan Hooker and Alex Caceres, we were all excited to see more of El Pantera and how far he could ascend in the featherweight rankings. But when news broke that his management team had encouraged him to call out none other than former UFC champion Frankie Edgar, there was no doubt it was a massive jump in competition. Now, to be fair to Yair, he did admit that inside the top five at featherweight, every fight was tough and that Frankie was most likely the hardest matchup. And in his words, Why should I pick the easier one? And following the UFC promo titled Yair Rodriguez 2017 is my year, he delivered the message, Champion 2017, this year, believing Edgar was his path to the title. So he took the fight, and unfortunately, things didn't go the way he'd planned. Edgar put on a wrestling clinic against the young Pantera, earning 8 minutes and 26 seconds of control time in a bout that lasted only 10, before the doctors stopped the fight due to the swollen mass that was now Yair's face. Edgar had unloaded ground and pound from top position with an outmatched Yair in survival mode for pretty much the entire contest, taking far more damage than your average fight. Yair had certainly underestimated his own skill level against that of his opponent, it being too soon for him to compete at that level. Number 8. Damian Meyer vs Gunnar Nelson Fan interest in any MMA matchup is often specific to the fighters themselves, but generally, the prospect of two strikers looking to light each other up is always one to get the audience screaming. However, fan intrigue was equally piqued when two of the best grapplers in MMA were set to fight following the announcement of UFC veteran and BJJ legend Damian Meyer facing off against the stoic submission machine Gunnar Nelson. 
we all knew just how credentialed and talented Maya was based on the level of competition he had faced and, of course, submitted. But Gunner had been heralded as the next big grappling threat in the UFC and had only lost one of six fights in his UFC career. It was a big step up in competition on paper, but one Gunner thought he could handle, describing the bout as a grappler's dream matchup and expecting a few good scrambles. It was all very laid back, Nelson's personality in a nutshell, but the fight itself wouldn't be as relaxing as the soothing tones of his voice. The fight did indeed deliver a high-level jiu-jitsu match, albeit not a very competitive one, with Nelson continuously on the defensive, seemingly one step behind Maya, defending submission attempts and eating a lot of ground and pound. Much of the pre-fight coverage had been Nelson answering questions about training with Ido Portal and Conor McGregor for his Jose Aldo bout taking place on that same card, glossing over the high-level opponent he had in front of him in Maya. It was all too much, too soon for Gunny, as Maya showed himself to be several levels above him that night. Number 7. Paolo Costa vs Israel Adesanya Certain stereotypes have always existed in mixed martial arts. The American wrestler, the European kickboxer, and of course, the Brazilian brawler. Following in the wake of Brazilian legends such as Vitor Belfort and Vanderlei Silva, Paulo the Eraser Costa steamrolled his way through the UFC middleweight division, TKOing all but one of his five opponents en route to a title shot against the style bender himself, Israel Adesanya. The man was ferocity personified, and he matched up excellently against the smooth and technical striker Adesanya. However, if you ask Costa about Israel, he would tell you, I don't know who, who is him. I will destroy him. I will hit him so badly. So, according to Costa, this should be a walk in the park. Israel had never fought anyone as big as him, and he was happy to go with threats of his KO power. Well, it just so happened that Costa, although powerful, had seriously underestimated the technical acumen of Adesanya and was dismantled at a distance, all the while Costa taunting the champion before he was cracked with a counter shot and on the end of a flawless victory. With Costa only landing 12 significant strikes across the nine-minute bout, Costa may have had the size and appetite of Conan, but he certainly bit off more than he could chew that night. Number 6. Jeremy Stevens vs. Jose Aldo Mixed martial arts is full of interesting characters, each with their own philosophies and energies surrounding them, some as cool and calm as an Icelandic stream like the aforementioned Gunnar Nelson, and some, like in the case of Jeremy Stevens, a bumbling volcano ready to erupt onto someone's chin. You should phrase that differently. Right. Little Heathen has made a career in the UFC gunslinging with the best of them, never quite reaching the top of his division but KOing stiff more than his fair share of competitors. However, in 2018, riding a three-fight win streak and angling towards the top of the featherweight rankings, he was matched up with former champion and UFC legend Jose Aldo, who was coming off the back of two straight TKO losses to champion Max Holloway with questions about his longevity in the sport starting to rise. Stevens, no doubt seeking to step in and take advantage of the former champion's losing streak, unleashed a tirade of trash talk in the lead up to the fight. I mean, look at his face, it's drooping. You know, he's been in a lot of wars, he's been in a lot of fights, the guy's got a lot of damage. Connor's taking his head, Max took his heart. I'm gonna take his soul. Clearly, he believed Aldo was a broken man and that he could snap off a piece of that legacy for himself. For as long as it lasted, the fight was a back and forth slugfest, with Jeremy testing the chin and will of Aldo. But the former champion proved he wasn't done yet, battling back from adversity and busting the liver of Stevens with a sickening body shot, leading to a TKO. Jeremy's plan had clearly backfired and perhaps only further stirred up the fight inside Aldo. Number 5. Matt Hughes vs BJ Penn For much of its infancy, the welterweight title in the UFC went through one man, American wrestler Matt Hughes, who had the division on lockdown for the better part of three years, all before a young prodigy BJ Penn came bursting onto the scene. 
BJ had amassed five wins in the UFC, but had failed to collect the lightweight strap after losing to Jens Pulver. So when he opted to jump up to 170 pounds and contend for the belt wrapped firmly around champion Matt Hughes' waist, it was no surprise that Matt dismissed his chances, stating it's somewhat disrespectful to move up into someone else's weight class, especially when he couldn't capture the belt in his own. Oh, how times have changed. He also noted that as a result of this, he didn't see BJ having the power to knock him out or submit him. Safe to say, Hughes had no problems accepting the fight, but once the bout got underway, the narrative he had spun began unraveling very differently. BJ stalked the champion and unloaded crisp boxing combinations, rocking him on the feet all before the fight hit the mat, with BJ controlling from top position. It wasn't long before he was at Matt's back and locked in a rear naked choke for the finish, capturing his first UFC title. Clearly, Matt had underestimated the prodigy BJ as the fight went against his predictions in almost every way, not only being rocked on the feet, but also dominated on the ground. BJ would later return to 155 and add another title to his collection. Number 4. Alexander Hernandez vs Donald Cerrone it's no secret that the UFC's lightweight division is one of the most competitive in the sport. The top 15 is jam-packed with talent and it can take years to move up to title contention. Alexander the Great Hernandez was well aware of this, of course, and decided that off the back of his two impressive UFC wins, he would add a little spice into the mix during the build-up to his next match against longtime veteran Donald Cerrone. The cowboy Cerrone is of course known for many things, adrenaline fueled adventures, head kick KOs and the sporadic nature of his UFC career. Hernandez also looked to take advantage of Cowboy's pattern of losses when he ramped up the hostility during pre-fight interviews, describing Cerrone as an insecure little lad swinging on a saddle with a pop gun and a feather in his hat. I'll tell you this, little friend, I'll be sending your geriatric ass fucking yeehawing back to the stables on Saturday. Ouch. Nonetheless, he described Cowboy as a stepping stone on his climb up the division, treating him like a ghost looking damn near straight through him. When it came to the fight itself, Hernandez expected to press him and break him, but Cerrone was able to weather an early storm as Alexander looked to do just that. As the fight continued, however, Hernandez began to slow as Donald slowly turned things up, letting fly with his Muay Thai combinations and ending things with his patented head kick and follow-up ground and pound. Hernandez's attempts to psych out Cerrone had completely backfired, and Cerrone successfully beat back another contender. Number 3. Diego Sanchez vs Nick Diaz once upon a time, Diego Sanchez was the barbarian of the UFC's lighter weight classes. More than that, he was a nightmare. Having won the first season of The Ultimate Fighter and his first UFC bout, he had proven to many he was a competent mixed martial artist and someone who belonged in the UFC. Opinions of course, well, you know what they're like, everyone's got one, including 209's prophet Nick Diaz, who exclaimed his disbelief not only at the fact Diego was being paid more than him, but upon accepting the bout the fact that he would already be in a UFC main event, despite him only winning a TV show and having one fight. He continued by dismissing his former opponents and letting everyone know the game plan, take it to him and fight him, basically beat his ass. It was pretty clear that Nick didn't believe Diego was on his level. Nonetheless, Diaz accepted the fight and the two met at the Ultimate Fighter 2 finale. From the opening bell, Diego shot a takedown and that's pretty much where the entire fight took place, with Nick scrambling underneath trying to avoid damage and set up sweeps and submissions and Sanchez content to hold top position and pound away. Diego ended the contest with over 10 minutes of control time as well as 5 takedowns with Diaz unable to stop the wrestling control and pressure. Nick had been dismissive of his credentials and never in his wildest dreams imagined losing to an Ultimate Fighter alumni. It was in reality more like a nightmare. Number 2. Aljamain Sterling vs Brian Caraway Long before Aljamain Sterling Funk mastered the bantamweight title away from Peter Yarn, he was primed for a number one contender spot in 2016, having remained undefeated in his MMA career and amassing a five-fight UFC win streak. 
The man in his way was five-year UFC veteran and bantamweight division staple Brian Caraway, who was set himself on finally getting his own shot at the belt as the two of them were matched up in a potential title eliminator bout at Fight Night 88. For months, Sterling had waged a slanderous social media campaign against Caraway to poke the bear, as he put it. This included featuring him on a poster celebrating International Women's Day in the UFC and calling him a parasite and a leech when referring to his personal relationship with then women's champion Misha Tate. Caraway responded to MMA Junkie's questions on the subject with the literal title of this list, believing Aljo would question, You know, thinking in his head, man, did I bite off more than I could chew? But the first round of the contest actually went Sterling's way, as he controlled on the ground and threatened with submissions. Come the second round, though, you could see the rage building behind Caraway's eyes as he took it to the young contender, forcing brawling exchanges on the feet, scoring takedowns, working ground and pound, and submissions. By the end of the contest, Aljo was clearly beaten, and Caraway had made his position clear. You mess with the bull, you get the horns. Number 1. Jake Ellenberger vs Wonderboy Thompson Seeing as we now have a title in the UFC for the baddest motherfucker, it was only a matter of time until the community crowned its nicest motherfucker. And who better to wear the crown than everyone's favorite karate sensei, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. So the idea that someone could have beef with such a pure and stalwart warrior is nothing short of heretical. But nonetheless, Jake Ellenberger had some choice words for Wonderboy in the build up to their matchup at the Ultimate Fighter 21 finale. In Initially, Ellenberger had been expected to fight Tyron Woodley, but after finding out the chosen one wanted to sit on his number three spot until a title shot presented itself, he settled for a bout with Thompson. How did he feel about the karate background of Thompson? Karate, that's funny. He even went so far as to exclaim that spinning kicks? Yeah, they don't work. Okay, Jake, whatever you say. His final prediction, however, was a one-sided beatdown, with the fight being a step back to the world title. The fight itself was an interesting affair, with Jake opting to remain mostly stationary and allowing Wonderboy to poke and attack him from the outside. However, he timed a fantastic overhand right, dropping Wonderboy, but after bouncing back to his feet and hearing his father shout spin, Thompson did just that, nailing two consecutive spinning hook kicks to the dome of Ellenberger and finishing the fight. Far be it from me to take this as an opportunity to show Jake the true irony in his words, as in the spirit of Wonderboy and the nicest motherfucker belt, I think two spinning kicks to the head did enough that night. Big shout out and thank you to Max Randall for editing this video. You can follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. Shout out to Ben Rosette and the excellent music he provided during the intro video. His music can be found on streaming platforms everywhere. There is a link in the description and follow him at Ben Rosette on Instagram and on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching everyone today. Please go ahead and like and subscribe if you did enjoy the content. We upload at least three videos every week for your viewing pleasure. Go ahead and leave a comment below if you want to join in the discussion and follow us on Twitter at MMA on Point and myself at Balian underscore plays. You can now jump in and join the community discord as well if you want to continue the discussion further and I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I'll see you in the next one.